control your ride. That was from our good friend Josh Blake. This is tuned into the void with Colonel Bruce Hampton in there in the introduction. Uh, Josh has a very special acoustic album coming out here very soon, and uh, we're looking forward to that show. Uh, Paper Crowns will be opening that show. All right. Well, uh, it's been a very special month. We've been featuring artists and, and performers of the upcoming Merle Fest, and Merle Fest is just about here. And uh, today's featured performer is David Lamont. And thank you for coming, and David. Appreciate really it. A pleasure to be with you, Spiro. Thanks for the hospitality. Right on. And uh, folks, if you would like to see what David Lamont has going on, you can go to his website. It's davidlamont.com. That's spelled L A M O T T E. And uh, David, thanks for uh, being here. When is your set at Merle Fest this weekend? I'm playing uh, 1215 on Saturday at the Creekside stage. So it should be a really nice time to be playing. It looks like the looks like the forecast is for um, low seventies and sunshine. So that sounds wonderful. Life's pretty good. Yeah. yeah, spring has sprung, and we're just trying to get as much of it as we can. It felt like a long winter. Yeah, yeah, it sure did, and it, it keeps teasing us. Last weekend was just one last little kick in the gut on the way out the door. Yeah, even, <laughs> even yesterday. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Even chilly. this morning, we we were up yeah. this morning early picking up. Uh, my uh, in-laws at the airport very early um, and they said surprisingly their red-eye flight was packed oh really yeah. well um, well David uh, let's uh, we're, folks if you're just joining us you could uh, stream live video of David Lamont it's uh, right now going out on the WPVM Facebook page and uh, David uh, what song would you like to perform for us Man, I can't decide. I got so many songs to pick from. That's a um, good problem. I'm not exactly sure. Let's see. Uh, I think I might have to do... Let's see how fast I can retune. I'm pretty quick. You're talking about airports. It makes me think of an airport song. I wrote this... Uh, I wrote this um, in 2010... And it was uh, April 25th when I wrote this oh, song. Wow. So it's about to have a burst birthday, this, this song. It's about to, about to turn nine on, well, on Thursday. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I happen to know that because it's my birthday. Oh, cool. Come and I had been down to a friend's wedding. Um, I took a couple years off from music after 18 years full-time on the road, and I went and did a master's degree in Australia. In peace wow. studies, I got this amazing uh, fellowship to pursue my other passion, which is peace work, and uh, went to Brisbane, Australia, to the study at the University of Queensland, and it was an a amazing adventure. It was really a good experience, but I was hanging out with academics for a while. I wasn't hanging out and with activists, but not really so much with musicians. Right. And then I, um, Woo. then I. Uh, got an invitation from a dear friend of mine who's an Australian musician who I'd known from earlier tours who uh, was getting married. In fact, she and her husband are both friends of mine and they asked me to come down for the wedding down, um, down south. And so I, I hopped on a plane and went down to their wedding. And you know how you don't realize you're, how thirsty you are until somebody gives you a glass of water and you're like, oh my goodness, that's what I needed, right? It was that kind of thing. I, was, I found myself at this wedding surrounded by musicians. I came out of the airport and there was a, a VW microbus at the curb full of musicians waiting for me to take, you know, to take me to the wedding. And uh, man, it was good to be among my tribe again. <laughs> right uh, on. 
That sounds song, so interesting. The song kind of came out of it. And when I wrote the song, I wrote it in tune. <laughs> Let's see if I can do it again. Let's see. So I race out in the morning And I'm headed for the sky To the wedding of a friend And I'm running late again But I make it through security And the multitude of lies And the boredom of the flight And nothing feels quite right But I find familiar faces when I Come back to the ground They are welcoming and warm At the center of the storm We have come to celebrate the love That the two of us have found To hold each other tight And hold this moment to the light Because this is what matters This is what's real open to the beauty to be strong enough to feel doesn't all we call important only matter in the end if it leads us home to love 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 home to love There are circles upon circles There are ripples to these lines It's not only these two It's to be among you All the lessons I have learned I have forgotten them in time But you reminded me again Of who I really am And when the blood is flowing back after my arm is fallen numb There's a measure there of pain But it's come alive again And it seems that's what has happened to The man I had become Like the springtime to a tree You have reawakened me And this is what matters This is what's real open to the beauty to be strong enough to feel doesn't all we call important only matter in the end if it leads us home to love love, love, love home to love yeah. home to what matters, what's real, oh, to love. Wow, what a beautiful full sound. Folks, that's David Lamott. You can catch all of his news at davidlamott.com, L-A-M-O-T-T-E. And uh, David is also performing this weekend. Uh, at the Merle Fest, com- or at Merle Fest, and when is your set again? It's twelve fifteen on Saturday at the Creekside Stage. Awesome! Yeah, so cool. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. What a treat to get to play at Merle Fest! Really, fun. indeed. And uh, man, what a great lineup! Uh, all kinds of very talented songwriters and performers, triple threat artists like yourself: songwriting, <laughs> performing, and singing. Yeah. Um, in, in the style that you're playing, that's a that's an open tuning. Yeah, it's an open D, which is kind of home for me. I love open D tunings. Um, I, I sometimes play in dadgad. I play in I probably play in eight or ten different tunings pretty often. But open D and standard are the two where I spend the most time. And and open D is just so so accessible. I I kind of feel like I got way too many projects lined up. But I have way on the back of the list. I have the idea that I'd like to 
write a beginning guitar book that started in open D instead of in standard. Awesome. Because it's so easy. I mean, well, for one thing, with no fingers on the left side, you know, on the left hand, you get this sound. It's already beautiful. You don't right. have to do anything but just hit those strings, and that's what you get. And then you start messing around in with uh, harmonics and things and everything. It's just hard to hit a wrong note, you know. You get, you start, um... Beautiful. You, you know, you just can't go wrong. Yeah. So you start throwing those pieces in the middle of the songs, and everything kind of opens up. The texture shifts. And texture really shifts. Yeah, it's a very cool, uh, yeah, very cool palette of sound that you have. It's different. Um, I enjoy the, the sounds of open tune instruments. Um, I once taught guitar years oh, yeah. ago for 13 right years, and I had a student. He was 80. He had, he had really wow. crippling arthritis. He said, well, I don't know if I could do this, but I want to come and try to play guitar. So the first lesson we tried, you know, standard tuning, just wasn't happening. Yeah, right. Next lesson I, I taught him open detuning, and he went and he awesome. got like a... Got a slide? He, no, he, oh. he learned it just by mashing his fingers, as he'd awesome. say. He'd just right. put his finger up on the fret. He went and got like uh, the little metallic numbers that people put on their mailboxes. Yeah. And he put one, two, three, all the way to number oh, 12. Oh, that's awesome. For his frets. He ended up becoming the worship team leader at his church. How and, cool is that? And wow. so uh, that was one of my favorite things. So open tunings, those things went. And uh, I've, I've also heard uh, that, uh, I don't know if this is true or not, because I don't really know much about this stuff, but the, the D note is... Or the represents the heart chakra. Um, it get, it seems that way to me. I really it just it I can go deep with with that tuning. Yeah. Yeah. And people do seem to resonate, you know, which is just a fascinating word to begin with in terms of all the meanings of that and how they relate to each other. Yeah. Very cool. It's a beautiful sound. Folks, you're listening to David Lamont here live on WPVM one oh three point seven FM. Um, could you play another one of your original tunes? Yeah, first? man. I will switch real quick to Dad Gad. I'll just tune one string, and um... now, do you uh, <coughs> takes a takes a heck of an ear to be able to tune on the fly like that? <laughs> um, is that something that you you feel more comfortable doing? Um, well, you tell me whether I should feel comfortable or not. <laughs> sounds good <laughs> to me. Hopefully, yeah, we got there. Um, um, yeah, it, it it has developed over the years. I've, I I think I had a pretty good ear when I was little, but it gets better. Do you have perfect pitch? Um, I don't. Th- I, you know, it's it, it maybe oh, I I've, okay. I've maybe near perfect pitch. I can't. You can't play me a note and I say, ah, yeah, that's a C sharp. Like, a, um, necessarily, I have to think about it a little bit to get there. But I'll be right probably more often than I'll be wrong if you play a note out of the air. Um, and I like to try to practice. Sometimes I like to try to practice tuning my guitars when I'm changing my strings. Take all the strings off, put them all back on, and see if how close I can get to to standard. And sometimes I nail it, but not every time. So I have imperfect pitch. That's what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Relatively, almost perfect pitch. <laughs> all right. Well, folks, this is David Lamont. their shiny hotel where the water meets the land they smiled a little nervously as the ocean took the sand they went down below the shoreline and they hauled it back again but the heavy rain and the hurricane and the water's gonna win Water's gonna win You can bring it all back It will wash away again Water's gonna win Pack it aboard, pack it in Water's gonna win The glass of water you were sipping As you watch the morning come Quench the thirst of seven others 
underneath a younger sun. We are memories and moments. We are born and born again. We are rushing stream, breathing steam in the waters. Gonna win, water's gonna win. Ascending and falling and rising up again. The water's gonna win. Pack it up or pack it in. All the rocks sign the papers for another glass of gin. Cut the ribbon with the scissors, but the water's gonna. Down beside the river just about a year ago, gave the ashes to the current, watched them swirl into the flow. You still hold it all inside you, you can't stop once you begin. Close your eyes, feel it rising. Hey, the water's gonna win. Water's gonna win. You can't hold back the tide. You can't hide from what's within. The water's gonna win. Feel it flow beneath your skin. The water's gonna win. It will keep flowing through all we are and all we've been. The water's gonna win forever. And I'm men. Water's gonna win. That's David Lamott live here in the WPVM studios playing his original music. And folks, you can key into David's uh, news at davidlamott.com. That's spelled L A M O T T E. Uh, I'm playing this weekend at Merle Fest. Um, that's beautiful stuff, man. And, you know, there's, there's a lot uh, that's really intriguing about your story. So you were on the road for 16 years, 18, yeah. 18 years. So long, yeah. And then you went and got a master's degree in peace <laughs> studies. Yeah. Now returning. How long has, have you been back? So I graduated with, um, that degree, that master's in 2010. And, um, so I've been back for nine years now and, the first three years I was living over in, um, after I lived in Australia and India, I did field work in India for the master's degree I was doing in Australia. So that was a fascinating adventure as well. I studied with wow. Gandhian folk there who, I had conversations with people eye to eye who told me about conversations they had with Gandhi. Wow. You know, <laughs> How and rich. these were people who were living in simplicity and doing service work and I got to work with them for a few months and study what they were up to and it was just such an extraordinary privilege and my wife and my son were with me so oh wow he was he was 10 weeks old when we moved to australia a year old when we moved to to india and he actually took off and took his first real steps at the taj mahal the day oh we... my goodness <laughs> what a great so it's just wild he's that always going to win that like two truths and a lie game like he's always going to win that <laughs> yeah yeah people are going <laughs> to learn to walk at the taj mahal <laughs> <laughs> well but that's awesome he's 10 now so um so since I came back, it's more been, I've been doing more speaking. I've written a couple of books, and so I get invited to do lectures and things as well. I did one a couple of days ago down in Georgia at, a, uh, at the University of West Georgia down there. So Is it a political or humanitarian? Uh, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, so it depends on which definition of political you're using. I think one of the, one of the things that we... Um, I think it would do us good as a society to dial in our semantics around that um, in terms of being, um, I think there are two common definitions of politics. One is the mud fight between political parties. And the other is any means by which a group of people makes decisions about what matters and who matters, what we're going to do, what we're not going to do, right? 
And that first conversation gets really cynical really fast, you know, and, and kind of self-defeating a lot of the time. It's important, but it's not the whole thing, right? Mm. But that latter conversation is extremely important. And I think often we need to think a little more in terms of the latter conversation than in terms of the former. The former conversation quickly degenerates to I'm right and you're wrong. And we start we stop listening to each other and it's hard to move forward together when we stop listening. But the latter conversation is a really honest, okay, look, we're here together. How do we do this? You know, what 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 scares you? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? Um, I can imagine you have to be very flexible to to fit within the modalities of other cultures and and uh, to fit in the, the the way that people identify you. Yeah, I I um I don't claim to be good at that all the time, but it's it's aspirational for me for sure. I I love. I well, I actually love getting outside my element. I just really love being in different cultures, and trying to perceive the ways people are communicating. And in all honesty, I think being a musician helps a lot because you are attuned to different ways of communicating that are not just verbal and are not just data-based, right? Um, right. Any good musician, often audiences, I find, think that they are passive at a concert, right? That the musician's doing it and they're just receiving it and have no idea how important their contribution to the moment is, right? And any musician will tell you, yeah, it's everything. <laughs> what the audience right. brings totally determines whether this is a beautiful event or whether it goes flat. And, and how things are interpreted. And how it's interpreted. And so the musician has to be watching the audience. The audience isn't saying a word, generally. But you got to be able to feel them. Mm -hmm. And I think once you get into language barriers and cultural barriers and such, it does you a lot of good if you can try to figure out how to be with people in ways that aren't just about exchanging data and making decisions. And, um, but where is our commonality and where do we relate? Where do we connect? And we go to open D for the heart chakra and hopefully start there. And then we can build out the information and the decisions we need to make. Where can folks find more information regarding your authorship? And so, yeah, my, my website's a pretty good place to go. David okay. Um, my both, well, I have three books. One of them's a silly children's book. It's just, for little kids, it's just rhyming, awesome. rhyming and fun, right? We took the lyrics to a children's song I wrote many years ago. I made a children's album. The title track to that album is SS Bathtub. So it's about a bathtub that gets used for a boat. And um, That's cool. <laughs> it's fun, and it's just all silly rhymes. Every line in the whole song rhymes with E, which is really a dubious decision, but it came out fun. And so we made a children's book from that. That was my first kid's book. But my second kid's book is only nominally for children it's it's really i wouldn't drop not for it. kids only not for kids only and it's um and it deals with some pretty intense things so i don't i, I don't really recommend it below third or fourth grade except for the exceptional kid that is ready for it but it tells a true story of a thing that happened in knoxville in 2007 there was a uh clan rally that was met by a clown rally oh i I heard about this. Yeah, and so, the clowns. so the the clowns sort of facetiously joined in. So when the clan starts chanting white power, the clowns start saying, oh, this is awesome. It's a rally for white flower. And they have a flower fight in the street. And they brought props. They rehearsed. This is um, uh, activists from a group called Mountain Justice who are environmental activists over there. And they trained and they worked out their street theater and they brought all their props. And they did the white flower gag for a while and then they got done with that and they said no no no, that's not what they were saying at all they were saying tight showers and they hold up a camp shower and they're crowding <laughs> beneath it and they're like no 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 you guys are hearing them wrong that's not what this is it's a rally for white flowers and they start handing out flowers and then they all pull on wedding dresses and they go this is a rally for wife power and eventually the Klansmen guys and it was neo-nazis and clan and um eventually they were so baffled they didn't know what to do they're used to being feared they're used to being hated. They can work off that energy, and they kind of like it. Right? Right. That's what they're stirring up. And so to give them that does not serve the situation. Right? right. It doesn't make things better. And these folks, had, had and I have nothing to do with it, um, but these folks came up with this brilliant, brilliant approach to subvert what they were doing with humor. Right. Isn't, it, isn't that interesting when you could take the power away from people just by showing them 
humor. Which is, which and, is love. and this is kind of silly, right? Like, right? <laughs> to, to just say, come on, guys, this is a little bit silly. That's and just hold cool. up the silliness of it. So, um, so they left an hour and a half early. It was very effective, more effective than it would have been to try to shout them down. Right? That's right. And, and it's such a contemporary parable of, of nonviolence that I just think the story needs to be told. So I wrote a poem about it, and then the poem became a book. And the way it ends, the, the kind of how it lands, the last few lines of it are, and what would be the lesson of that shiny southern day? Can we understand the message that the clown sought to convey? It seems that when you're fighting hatred, hatred's not the thing to use. So here's to those who march on in their big red floppy shoes. Cheers. <laughs> so that's uh, that's my second book. And then my third book has more words. It's not a kid's book. It's um, okay. an adult book. It's called World Changing 101, Challenging the Myth of Powerlessness. And it's really a book about hero narratives versus movement narratives. I think as a culture, we're really attached to hero narratives of how you fix a big problem. Mm -hmm. All our movies tell that story. You need right. somebody special with special strength or wisdom or something mm -hmm. or powers or whatever to come in a moment of crisis and take and do make dramatic action, take dramatic action in response to the crisis. And then you fix the problem and you roll the credits. And that's our story. If we were to drive to the nearest multiplex theater and count how many of those movies have that plot, it would, would be, be all most of them, of them yeah. almost all of them. Right. But it's a lie. It never happens that way. The way you actually approach a large problem and have an impact is by a movement, which is a lot of people doing a little bit each. And if we start to reprogram ourselves to think that way, then we're not powerless. We feel powerless because we feel like we got to be a hero to have an impact. But now, you don't. You just have to show up and do the next right thing, the next small thing. Does your does your book resource different uh, parts of mythology that you can compare highlighting this perspective? Of, the movement narrative? Of, yeah, movement narrative. Yeah, um, I, ha I haven't really gone to mythology so much. Um, I have looked more at the rare pop culture references where the movement narrative shows up. Mm -hmm. Even that's not really in the book, but I talk about it at, at lectures and things. But if you ask people what name, name 10 movies that have the hero narrative, it's not hard to do. Right. right. If you ask people, give me five movies that have the movement narrative. I would say like... Planet of the Apes, from the Apes' perspective. Okay, right, yeah. You know, uh -huh. Which I think a lot of people don't look at okay, from right. their perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Uh, no, no, it's, it's, I, I, I totally get what that. you're saying. It's, it's more difficult because it's not the way that our culture has perceived change right. being facilitated. Right. We've always embraced this narrative of a hero or heroine. Mm -hmm. And but, if you're not the hero, your job is to clap. Right. Which means that we kind of prefer the hero narrative a lot of the time, right? Oh, wow, that's so deep. Right, right? Because um, <clears throat> it's easier. If I'm not the hero, I just get to clap. It's awesome. And if, and if I have a really big problem, I need to fix it. Well, the first thing we need is the crisis chr chronologically. And then we need the hero. Where do you get the crisis? Where do you get the hero? Right. I don't know. You wait, right? And you just wait and wait some more. And that's the narrative. You got a big problem? Here's your goal. Wait. And yeah. then the hero will come, right? But it barely works out that way. Oh, it's, it's like a so, snake eating its own tail. Right. Way. And you never really find examples in history. We find plenty of examples of heroic action. People are tremendously heroic. They do amazing things every day. But if you're addressing a large-scale problem, I can't find a single example of history of a hero addressing a large-scale problem in the absence of a movement. Folks... DavidLamont.com. What a what an interesting cat, man. <laughs> so talented, so interesting, multifaceted. A real a real treat to have you in today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your patience with me today. That's DavidLamont.com. L A M O T T E. Catch him. Been a pleasure. Thanks so much, Spiro. Really oh, good to have the time, you. folks. We got T minus eight seconds. We hope you join us next week every Monday at five for Asheville Local Live. We're turning you back over to WPBM programming. You're listening to WPBM LP 1037 on your dial in Asheville, North Carolina, and globally at WPBMFM.org.
Democracy Now! is underwritten by the French Broad Food Co-op, a grocery store focusing more on people than profit. By providing living wages, supporting local farmers and produce, and being community-owned.